Welcome to our Bible study for the 1st of November, 2020. Now notice, unlike most weeks, I didn't say that this was for the, you know, say the 21st Sunday after Pentecost or proper 24 or whatever that might be. Because this Sunday is All Saints Day which always falls on the 1st of November. So if it falls on a weekday, the lessons appointed for All Saints Day can be used on the Sunday that follows, and it's called All Saints Sunday. Or you can use the lessons for that day and celebrate All Saints Day as a standalone feast during the week. This year, because of the way the calendar's worked out, all Saints Day actually falls on Sunday, so nothing gets moved. There aren't two different sets of lessons available. There's one, and it's the lessons for All Saints Day because All Saints Day is one of those primary feasts that trumps other feasts, the same way, for example, Christmas or Easter do. Easter always falls on a Sunday, but if Christmas falls on a Sunday, its lessons trump whatever other lessons might have happened that Sunday otherwise. So here we are, and the first thing you'll notice about the lessons for all saints is that we don't start out with a lesson from the Old Testament. In fact, we start out with a lesson from the very last book in all of the Bible, from Revelation. And we're in chapter 7 of Revelation, verses 9 through 17. John looking upon and seeing a great multitude that no one can count. Now, this lesson is often used at the Feast of a Martyr. So if we were to look at the lessons appointed for a saint's day for somebody who had been martyred, somebody who died for the faith, say St. Lawrence the deacon, or uh, Perpetua and her companions, things of, you know, famous saints who died. Uh, we might see these lessons as those appointed for a martyr. Uh, this lesson recounts John's vision of the salvation of the multitude of the servants of the Lord. Uh, it also can show up at a funeral, for example. And in this second vision of the salvation of the righteous, it, we get the climax of the opening of the seven seals, the seven seals that are opened in Revelation to progressively reveal God's will for how it all plays out at the end of time, at the end of the age. The people in this vision, the great multitude that no one could count, are contrasted deliberately with those referred to in the previous vision, in other words, in verses 1 through 8 in chapter 7. And that vision refers to 144,000 people, 12 times 12,000. We take the 12 tribes of Israel, a perfect number. We take 12,000, another biblical number. We get 144,000. That first group is numbered meticulously and comes from the tribes of Israel. The second group, however, cannot be numbered, comes from all the earth. Now, Christians who preach a predestination to salvation often argue that the number of the saved is somehow limited, that it's 144,000 on the basis of that number in the first vision. However, John links the two visions with the message being clear that any predestination to salvation is not limited by number. Because even if we take the 144,000 and say this applies to the 12 tribes of Israel, then we have to ask a different question. Is this the 12 tribes of Israel for all time? Is this the 12 tribes of Israel as of the time of John's vision? Uh, God doesn't like to put things in small boxes, and he won't, of course, himself be put in a small box. The idea of the plenitude of God's mercy, the multitude that none can number, points us to the fact that worrying about a select group predestined to salvation is missing the point that by linking the two visions, John is making clear that God's mercy is not limited. 
Uh, the scene here, in fact, is set as a scene of victory. Palm branches are brought forward, the symbol of victory. The word salvation in the verse 10 language here, salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb, is in Greek soteria. Now, this word means salvation, but it also means victory, paralleling the Hebrew word yeshua, which means welfare, deliverance, salvation, or victory. It's used in the sense of victory, for example, at 1 Samuel 14, 45, at Habakkuk 3, 8, at Psalms 20, verse 6, and 44, 5. But notice that word is a name. The Hebrew word Yeshua is a cognate of the name Jesus. The name itself, Jesus, derives from Joshua, which means deliverance is in the Lord. Jesus literally means the Lord saves. And so the final cry of victory at the second coming, at the unsealing of the seven seals at the end of the age, is a cry that brings forth the name of our Lord. The robes of the righteous who gather before the throne, the multitude that none can count, these pure robes symbolize the pure spiritual state of the righteous. They have been washed in the blood of the Lamb through repentance, conversion, and baptism. You know, people sometimes make jokes that when it's all over, all the pieces go back inside the box, like you're putting a Monopoly uh, game back in the box or some other board game. The point by the limitless scope of this vision is that when all the pieces go back inside, there is no inside, there is no outside, there is just the plenitude of God's mercy for which we may be eternally grateful. Now, we move from this vision to the first 10 verses of Psalm 34, an individual psalm of thanksgiving and in Hebrew, the psalm is an acrostic addressing the just and encouraging them to join the psalmist in praising God. The content of the psalm reflects the traditional teaching from wisdom literature that all goes well for the righteous. If we go back to Psalm 1, it says there are two paths. And we're going to follow the one path, which is the Lord's will, and live like trees planted by streams of water and be blessed or we're going to follow our own path and wither. That's the wisdom literature that this psalm reflects. Uh, it also reflects the theme of the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and it is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord tells me who is in charge, not me. It's God. When I recognize that, I properly fear God. I properly recognize how the world, how creation works, what God's will is, and I try to align my will with God's will. Now, when I fail at that, because I'm a human being and fallen, I can turn to Christ and be picked up by the Holy Spirit and start following Jesus again, but to fear the Lord is to acknowledge his supremacy over all. May we so fear God that we seek always to follow his son. The epistle appointed is from the first letter of John. And St. John is making it clear in this passage in chapter 3 of the epistle that we experience God's goodness already in this life and that he has made us his children. In other words, salvation is not some far-off future thing that we aspire to. Salvation is something we experience now when we place ourselves in a spiritual state to receive it. There are three consequences to the reality that salvation happens now. The first is that Christians do not belong to the world. The world has failed to receive Jesus. We who have received Jesus and who do receive Jesus do not belong to the world. We belong to Christ. 
And therefore, the second consequence, Christians will lead lives of holiness following Christ. The third, Christians are confident now of an even greater salvation in the future, that vision, for example, from Revelation of eternal blessing. Jesus has shared his name with us. Jesus, who is God, has shared his name with us. Yeshua, God saves, the Lord saves. This means that the true believer becomes, in effect, more godlike, which is sort of the Eastern Orthodox theology of theosis, that we become more and more godlike to the extent that we participate in Jesus' life. Every time we receive his blessed body and blood in communion, we become just a little bit more Christ-like when we confirm ourselves to him. We end up in the Gospel lesson in chapter 5 of Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount. And we get the Beatitudes from the Sermon on the Mount. We can compare these Beatitudes to chapter 6 in Luke's Gospel, which is technically the Sermon on the Plain. But Matthew lists eight Beatitudes here, seven plus one. Luke has four, three plus one. The three that are common between the two Gospels are likely direct quotations from Jesus. In giving the Beatitudes, Jesus both echoes and embodies the good news that God has revealed throughout. For example, back at Isaiah 61. The additional Beatitude in Luke reflects probably early Christian church teaching. And the additional four Beatitudes in Matthew reflect his introduction on the blessings listed in the Psalms. So, let's look at the Beatitudes themselves. A Beatitude is a form of congratulation that recognizes an existing form of happiness. The form is not that one will be blessed, but that one is blessed. It's not future tense. So, for example, when Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, he's not saying that the poor will be happy because they're morally superior and thus will enjoy a future blessing if they are in fact morally superior, but that they are blessed now because of God's special care for them. Because they're poor, they have fewer distractions and can focus more on God's presence. The blessedness is present tense. Uh, blessed are the poor in spirit. These are people who are humble. They are humble and therefore can be attentive to God's will. Blessed are the meek, those who are slow to anger because their will is aligned with God's. Those who mourn, blessed are the mourn, are those who mourn the evil they see on earth. This is not specific to people who are grieving over a lost one, for example, but who are mourning the fallen state of creation. Blessed are the merciful, those who pardon their neighbors, as referred to in the Lord's Prayer. The other categories listed here by Matthew can be interpreted on our common understanding of the terms used. Uh, so there's no code here. The use of the Beatitudes here in the commemoration of all saints reflects the reality that those set aside for God are blessed regardless of the outward circumstances of their lives. Now, who are those set aside for God? These are the same people whom Paul refers to as the holy ones, the saints, when he addresses them and says to the saints in Corinth, to the holy ones in Thessaloniki. If he were to write to us in Laurel today, he would say to the holy ones in Laurel. Why? Because what holiness means in the Bible, in both Hebrew and Greek, is those those things, those persons, set aside for God. Which means us, those who follow Christ, those who bear his name, those baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. When you're baptized, 
The priest pours water over you, or you're immersed in the water. And you're baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. You receive the Holy Spirit. Coming up out of the water, or having had the water poured upon you, then the priest takes chrism of anointing and makes the sign of the cross on your forehead and says, you are marked as Christ's own forever. You've been set aside. And so you are one of the holy ones that can experience the blessedness of which Jesus speaks in the Sermon on the Mount as a present tense experience of the reality of holiness in this life, in that boundless, limitless blessing described in the vision of the end of time in Revelation. And we may pray with the psalmist to give thanksgiving in all things. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.